So the first thing I want to do is uh, make a question myself to each one of you and I uh, told you over email that you had five minutes to answer it, but you're going to have three. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, because uh, we're a little bit late and I do want to hear from the audience. So I'm going to start in reverse, or, uh, reverse order. Patricia, uh, you have not only contributed tremendously uh, to our knowledge of the relationship between political violence and development across many regions of the world, and you showed that in your short presentation, but you have also been instrumental to increase the, the number of scholars that work on these issues across the world, as well as to coordinate them uh, through the creation of networks and joint initiatives. So you have been an inspiration to many of us. So given your knowledge of so many different contexts throughout the world and your, uh, and your uh, network of co-authors, what are the main differences in the relationship between inequality and violence across the world and what might be some of the key factors that shape these regional differences? That is the question to you and I'm going to uh, ask the other questions uh, and then give you three minutes. So Diana, uh, Diana already anticipated what my question was going to be, which is, uh, okay, so your presentation was uh, very interesting about uh, the diagnostics of the problem in, in the city of Bogota. I know, uh, so I did my homework and I, I, I know that there are many initiatives in, in the secretary uh, to address these issues. Uh, so for instance, El Primer Paso and uh, opportunities for women such as income generation and training and all that. Um, I was particularly interested in uh, what I saw about uh, uh, and I'm going to say in Spanish, apologies, Casas de Igualdad de Oportunidades para las Mujeres, that it seems to be particularly go at the heart of uh, what we're discussing today, Igualdad de Oportunidades, and one of the issues that you do in these Casas de Oportunidades is to sensibilize women uh, uh, towards the reduction of violence against them. Uh, so I want to hear a little bit about you know the initiatives that the secretary are doing, and particularly about this this initiative that seems particularly important in this context. Um, so Anna, you also have been a leading expert in studying uh, things such as subnational governance, and you have challenged the conventional wisdom wisdom uh, uh, by showing that oftentimes rebels substitute the state in large parts of countries. So clearly the extent to which inequality triggers violence and shapes productivity depends on the underlying institutional strength and state capacity. So my question to you is how does rebel governance shape the relationship between inequality, violence and productivity in, in conflict affected areas? And finally, Marcela. So you devised and coordinated uh, this, this regional report, which argues that beyond re reinforcing one another, violence and inequality are concomitant to many of the main challenges that the region faces nowadays. Uh, for example, economic growth, corruption, trust, clientelism, uh, just to mention a few, and many of these issues have been mentioned by uh, either Anna or, or, or Patricia. So while well, this implies that policies to promote regional development should be coordinated across sectors and across countries of the region, this is something that, we, that in the region uh, we rarely see. Uh, so the region lacks this coordination. How can we achieve better coordination? What are the main bottlenecks to that coordination? And what is the UNDP or what can the UNDP do to help achieve this goal? So those are the questions. Uh, so let's start with you, Patricia. Okay, so maybe two minutes. Because as usual, this is always very scary to have one uh, uh, <laughs> being the chair of these things, because uh, he asks the first question and he starts a, a new uh, research program. So we could be here for, for a while. <laughs> maybe we come back in, in 10 years one and ask that, answer that question. But uh, one of the things that is quite striking in this literature, uh, we started by looking at the effects of inequality on uh, political violence, but on civil wars particularly. I started looking at uh, civil war outcomes, and one of the things across the world that is the lack of causal evidence. No, doesn't doesn't seem to happen. Whereas we know from other uh, uh, literatures outside economics that there has to be something in there. So. Um, 
So the movement then was to start looking at first at different forms of violence and then unpacking what this inequality thing actually means. Um, in terms, so I, I was very sweeping through the thing, but one of the things that seems to come across in not a very dissimilar way across all these countries is the impact of inequality seems to be stronger on lower on, on events of low levels of violence like rioting, protests and so forth. There seems to be more consistency than looking at civil wars, etc. And of course homicides. I mean th that usually, I mean in terms of, of criminal violence and homicides, that seems the evidence seems to be there as well. And it's not that different. Uh, I, but one main difference, I'm not going to anticipate on this question, but one main difference has, uh, has to do with the institutional capacity of countries. So if we're going to see how one thing, when the inequality impacts on all these kind of violent, undesirable outcomes, has to really do with the institutional capacity of the country to, and I'm repeating myself, to sort of uh, maintain the social contract, uh, ensure security, ability to uh, make sure that uh, services are provided to citizens, etc. For instance, the rising protests that we see in Latin America, which Anna showed uh, since 2013, a lot of it is actually due to not so much shifts in inequality per se, but how the middle class has perceived their living standards in relation to, say, the upper classes. So there's been a, so a story about the middle class as opposed to the traditional inequality, the way we see inequality, which is the difference between the bottom and the top. Um, so um, that would be my answer. So that doesn't really answer anything. Like I said, this is a huge research agenda to compare countries because they're so different how these things measure and then data is a mess. Uh, but if I had to say two things would be, uh, look, it, it, it varies across different types of violence, including what, uh, the, what the types that Anna mentioned. I just know of a project by Anke Hoffler who's looking actually at the impact of inequality on domestic violence and she sees effects, really strong effects, uh, and against abuse against children as well. And uh, the, 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 the role of the state in all of this as well seems to be important, but I know Anna is going to say probably more about that. So, so thank you, uh, Juan. And I think I mentioned previously that Bogota clearly adopts and believes on the twofold, right? The two analyzing and addressing violence resonates with violence causes inequality, and then inequality can be a causal effect of inequality or correlated. Because I insist we should make a bit of that difference constantly. And so the way to address it in some of the few things that Juan mentioned, and thank you for doing your homework, Juan, um, reflect how we offer those services. So let me briefly tell you. So with regards to direct services to prevent and assist or attend those who've been victims of violence. One, there's clearly, Juan mentioned Dal Primer Paso. And Dal Primer Paso is a campaign that basically calls women to step out. Both women and anybody who knows of a case of violence. But then we had to expand our services. But there was also this idea that women, that we should go where women are naturally going if they're victims of violence, which implies a way of switching the mindset of how usually the public sector works, which is, this is the service we have, and you must adjust to it, which is not, where do you need us to be? And that was our switch. So what did that imply? We created three 24-hour, uh, seven days a week services because violence occurs everywhere in the city and it occurs at all times. And so one was the purple hotline, which is our violence hotline. And it existed previously, but it had a 30% effectiveness rate, and we increased it to an average of a 96%. Why? Because the pandemic also increased our report on domestic violence. But we also had to WhatsApp, uh, expanded the WhatsApp. Why? Because the youth that are suffering violence are not used to calling. They WhatsApp. So we had to adjust to the ways young women are reporting cases of violence. Also, sign language for deaf women. We had to have a way for them to report their cases of violence. Another service, and, and this is all to say, if you want us to, if we want you and inviting you to step out, um, this is what we have for you. 
Another service is having lawyers 24-7 at hospitals. When we compared the data of sexual violence reported to the police, the, the police data, in comparison to the health services data, we saw a huge gap in, in the graph, right? Increasing in hospital data and very flat with police data. And so we realized women are not stepping out to the police, they're going to hospitals if they're victims of sexual violence. So we decided to have lawyers there next to the ER room where we can actually help them file a case, give them a uh, un cupo and the emergency shelters. So that's another thing of how we want women to step out. We have psychological and legal aid free, which is something you mentioned in your report. We have to address the psychological and emotional and mental health burden of violence if we want to address this. So that's the way it's being addressed and having pro bono lawyers taking cases. Um, also, you mentioned the House of Opportunity, Las Casas de Igualdad de Oportunidades. Those are basically the they're in all districts in Bogota, in the 20 districts, and they're for women. Women feel closer. The reports show, and women actually say, if, if they don't have to go to the big macro institution, they don't have to reach the secretary for women, but they go to homes, like closer to how they feel. And that's where we also have lawyers and psychologists, both uh, that offer these services for free to orient uh, victims that have been victims of violence. Um, let me, leave, oh, and, and, and the last thing we have is not everybody, not all women suffer violence in the same way. So the intersectional approach to the study of violence, which is a suggestion I have for the further reports, because I think you've made a great step in putting your focus, as I mentioned in my previous intervention, on those that are left behind the LGBT and women and, uh, and women from racial groups and so forth. But the intersectoral impact is huge. And so Casa de Todas is where we address the violence of women engaged in prostitution and migrants, especially non-legal, uh, not in a legal status. But as I said, we resonate with a two-pronged approach. So we could not only address violence, we also need to we also need to address the causes of maybe not inequality measured in the Gini coefficient, which I would agree that citizens don't have it in mind, but they do feel the inequality daily. So they do feel their access, lack of access to education, lack of access to free time. And that's why in tandem with the services for, so, for violence, we're increasing the services for women who are burdened with the care, with the care burden. Because as I mentioned, and I don't have time to go into what the care system is, but if we know that the three variables that are highly correlated with the probability of being a victim of violence is your lack of education, lack of internet access, and lack of free time, that's what we're offering women through our care system. The, and all this to address one variable, which I think, and with this I conclude, should become even more important when we understand both inequality and violence, which is the variable of time poverty. Time poverty is a driver of inequality, and women are the main victims, are the main, uh, or those with the la less lack of time. And time, if you don't have time to address a lawyer, if you never have time to go to uh, a mental health uh, service, if you never have time for free time or to leave your home, all that re translates into time poverty. And I think that's the common variable that ties violence and inequality and should be put at the forefront. Okay, so thank you for the very good and very difficult question. Um, so just to remind you, the, the question that Juan asked is, uh, how does rebel governance, and I would add criminal governance, which applies to many other places in Latin America, impact the relationship between inequality, violence, and productivity? So the, the short answer is that we don't really know yet. Um, there are uh, several people starting research, or, or having done for a, years, for a few years, research on this, um, but we are trying to unpack this. But So I want to start by saying why it is so difficult to, to study this. So the first one is civil war and I think organized crime, especially with the kinds of groups that we have in Latin America, 
is a shock that includes many different shocks, right? So it's not just the violence, it's not just the rebel governance or the criminal governance. So there are many big, deep um, structural changes that are happening during the war or in the areas where these groups operate. And isolating the effect of, let's say, violence or rebel governance or criminal governance is really difficult, right? The second thing is that there are impacts that happen during the war that we don't fully understand, um, which may or may not prevail after these groups leave. For example, there can be very important changes uh, in, to, in the redistribution when these groups create new elites. So when these groups control the territory, there are new winners and new losers. You may end up with a lot of new sectors of the population that are more vulnerable and with less representation and with less income, and you also have new elites. What happens when the armed actors leave? That depends on a lot of things, including whether there was a peace process with real policies, for example. Um, it also depends on people's trust in state institutions and to what extent they are willing to denounce um, illegal behavior after the war ends, right? Um, if these groups or these elites continue to use violence, for example, to, to defend their interests. There can be changes in individual behavior, how they see the state, how they see institutions, their social behavior, which also translates into all kinds of economic outcomes, right? Whether you have uh, people trusting each other more and engaging in new economic um, activities or not. What are the policy preferences? Do they care about redistribution? Are they aware of redistribution locally in their municipalities? So all of these can impact many factors that in turn translate into inequality, into violence, uh, just whether people use violence to solve conflicts, to advance their interests or not, and into productivity. Right? So it's, it's, it's complicated. Um, if we only focus on sort of the, the institutional components of rebel and criminal governance, we may think that these groups are creating institutions, they are providing order, they are reducing uncertainty, if you compare two places where these groups operate, but they are not governing, right? And there is a lot of uncertainty, people cannot make expectations about what will happen. So if we think that this operates as in peacetime, you would expect a positive relationship between, say, more rebel governance, what, what I call rebelocracy, and, um, and, and better outcomes, right? But if people are perceiving these institutions as being uh, very short term, then there is also a lot of uncertainty. So I'll end by saying that there are a few papers out there that have been trying to find these effects. Uh, with Patricia, Ana Maria Ibañez, Juan Camilo Cárdenas, Julián Arteaga, we have a couple that show, actually against our expectations, that uh, more rebelocracy, so I more intense rebel governance leads to uh, more resilience to weather shocks, uh, higher levels of trust and, and social networks. There is also just, th there is this paper um, that many of you may have seen by Antonella, Oh, what is her last name? Yeah. Uh, Bandiera and co-authors that actually find that for El Salvador, places that were ruled by guerrillas are showing lower levels of economic development, right? So it's just a research agenda that, that is starting and there is a lot to learn. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Juan. When, when we started conceiving the regional report, the, we, we thought about factors that are behind both high inequality and uh, low growth. And for sure, there are more than the ones that we can address in the report. Picking uh, to focus on violence has to do with an intent to bring together these conversations out of the concern that we usually work in silos. And this is how we work in academia, but also how we governments work. No? We usually think about the Ministry of Labor uh, in charge of labor market regulations, sometimes in charge of social protection systems, the Ministry of Education in charge of education, but not speaking necessarily with labor market institutions and so on and so forth. This is part of a development trap, I, I, I believe. So I am um, very happy actually to be sitting together with you guys here, people who work on violence. I am the new one, I am the generalista of the, of the group. But uh, we have them speaking about economic growth, and I, and I think we need to start uh, crossing these conversations because I think part of the solution to, to our development problems uh, is, is there. So that's um, the, the big take on why uh, choosing violence and why um, worrying about violence as a source 
also of uh, low productivity and low growth. Something that if um, we convince people who are actually in charge uh, of handling our countries and managing economies and the worry of, of, of growth, if we are able to convince them that this, this is something that really matters, it will probably start climbing up in the steps of attention in terms of policy assign. I, I think I will leave it there. I, yeah. I, I, I think it's a, you, you said what, what can we all do, what can the UNDP do? I think promote these type of interactions uh, at all levels when we are doing research but, and also when we are actually uh, doing operational stuff. I'm just going to close with one anecdote that I was thinking about when you asked me many, many years ago, Ana Ibanez and I were very young economists and someone asked and so what do you do? And Ana said, she thinks about firms and I think about people. And I went like, oh my God, I've always thought about firms because I care about people. So these type of silos in which we like sort of uh, put each other into little boxes, I think th they are very damaging and that's like the message I would want to conclude with. So before, before the Q&A, please join me in thanking our, our speakers today. So uh, feel free to raise your hand. I'm going to ask you to ask very brief questions. And we're going to collect some questions, five questions more or less, before uh, giving the floor to the speakers again. So very brief. I'm, doing, I'm going to do my best to be brief. Um, so thank you very much uh, for the to the four of you. It was amazing to see this. And I'm really happy that it's a woman panel talking about violence and, and also gender-based violence. So my question is related with the, uh, the, the true el, el report de la Comisión de la Verdad, the, the report of the True Commission. Like in the, cha in the chapter of children and adolescents, one of the things that you can see in there is that the, a lot of children go to the guerrilla just because it's the only option. And, and I'm thinking about here in how we reduce that inequality, because for, he, for us who live in Bogota, like we, we say there is a lot of options, but if you live in a, in, a, in a town where the option is like not eating or go to the guerrilla, or, and they say like, okay, the, the, the meal that they eat the first day they arrive to the guerrilla is, is really the best meal that they have eaten in the, in the field. So, my question is, in a context like that, how do you deal with that? Because it's like you have a 2020, a cash 2020, you have violence, you have inequality, you have poverty, and you have everything. So it's like, what suggestions? I don't, I know that is not an easy question, but how do you deal with that? Thank you. Great. Please coordinate among yourselves who is going to address these questions. <laughs> Yes, I, I want to join in thanking you for very interesting presentations, a really good mix of practice and, um, and analysis. My questions are more on the analysis and I'll try to keep them short. So Patricia referred to the fact that inequality can be measured in very different ways, but I feel that the previous, um, Anna and uh, Marcella referred to inequality in very general terms. And I do think that I, I'm not an expert on this topic, but I think on income inequality as the evidence is inconclusive that there are links to conflict conflict or violence in general, but when it comes to group-based or also uh, horizontal inequality, there are some causal, causal links that have been established, especially in relation to ethnic uh, inequality. So I wanted to ask if you could be a little bit more specific on what kinds of inequality you see mattering most and, and not mattering. Um, and, and then to Patricia on redistribution which, uh, 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 of course, it can prevent or, or reduce violence, but I was wondering if when at, at one point when there is more redistribution, and especially if redistribution comes in the form of better public services, and thus they create a demand for better services, whether uh, this increase in, in expenditure in general cannot um, provoke protest and eventually conflict even. Um, if there is a demand for quality that is not yet there, Quantity has increased, but there's a quality that is not yet there. I don't know if I'm clear in that last question. Thanks so much. Thank God that I asked for brevity. Sure, thank you. Um, I think first to welcome the presentations. Uh, my question really is provoked by the remarks that uh, Professor Justino was making um, around the 
higher demands for redistribution or the preference for redistribution and how that might explain um, you know, the affinity for political violence. Um, so one of the things you were saying there was you know, the prospect of public provisioning, especially insofar as it creates alternative safety nets, um, might sort of limit the preference for armed action or violence. And I'm quite interested in why that is the case. Um, so one, is it because the relative payoffs to armed violence um, are shifted when people have access to an alternative safety net? Or is it because, I guess in a sense, what happens to the armed groups or those that have a potential for violence is that the social base that they are reliant on for their criminal governance system would be attracted to forms of public provisioning or alternative safety nets and therefore um, they wouldn't have some credibility or legitimacy for the violence that they have. So I'm quite interested in, I guess, what you attribute uh, the decline in the utility of violence in that case um, and, and what role in redistribution is played there. Is it because the relative payoffs are now, you know, uh, um, sort of shifted somewhat or is it because the social base that in a sense might legitimize that uh, or give credibility to that armed action uh, is effectively, you know, covered by the provisioning and some of the alternative safety nets. Okay, Pastor Mike, call the way. Gracias. Esta es una pregunta para toda esta mesa tan chévere, pero es una respuesta también a un estudio que se realizó en la Universidad Nacional hace algunos años sobre la violencia intrafamiliar. Y la conclusión fue que el alcohol era el generador del conflicto. Se, se hizo el trabajo, se presentó en las lecturas dominicales del tiempo y después nos dijeron de algún lado que debíamos calmarnos y no eh, presentar esos trabajos así. Porque recuerden que el alcohol es el que ayuda aquí a la educación y la salud en el país. Entonces, pues eso fue un trabajo que no tenía, tenía una presentación social y una presentación científica y mmm, precisamente hicimos las pruebas con, en sangre con, las, con los hombres que tomaban alcohol y cuando el hombre toma alcohol su testosterona se convierte en progesterona y cuando llega a la casa encuentra a otra mujer y por eso es que empieza a pegarle encuentra a otra mujer, entonces pues es, de, es un punto de vista diferente desde el punto de vista económico, pero la violencia viene desde ahí, desde el hombre cuando consume alcohol y es una acotación que quería hacer, si tienen alguna aclaración o algo… Thank you for the question. So very briefly, um, the question on recruitment, that's totally true. And I collected data on ex-combatants many, many years ago. One of the findings uh, was that minors, and most of them join when they are minors, join these groups basically fleeing from poverty, domestic violence, especially women, um, and the violence related to, to the war. What can we do? I think, of course, the, the obvious Difficult answer is we need development, right, which is everything, but, but more specifically before we get there, I think that communities that have been able to have stronger mechanisms for collective action are more able to shield a little bit their families, minors from these armed groups. So that's one thing that I think we can do sort of while we build institutions and, and, and the economy and public goods and all of that. Um, and then the question on inequality, well in my work I actually focus on very different forms of inequality. Income is just a tiny piece, so I'm, I'm focusing on inequality in human security, in human rights, in income, health, education, um, local democracy and local governance, right? So I'm not uh, looking at income and I'm looking at both interpersonal inequality and group inequality because in, in my work subnational inequality is very, very important. And I'll I think you wanted to see Anna, I'll compliment to your question and I think because it still remains. Today we might not be not as common for the former guerrilla to be recruiting the youth, but we have it in Bogota, uh, transnational gangs recruiting the youth. So we still find it. And I guess the main uh, 
the main point I want to make is if we want to tackle an issue of violence, it cannot come only from a security approach. I think that's the main lesson that this report and that on the ground lessons leave, which is it's been mainly a security approach and that's where we fail because, I th because we know factors that are both correlated and causal, both that constitute inequality that lead to violence or that are correlated with violence. So if you really want to change this, we need to address them in tandem. So we have to come in with more education, not only more police. We need to come in with access to opportunities, not just more of the armed forces. Um, thank you. Those are great questions. Let me start with the easy one, uh, or the, easy, the, the one that I can ask, uh, I can uh, address Martha's point, which my answer is, we, we can talk about during lunch more about it. <laughs> It'll take a long time to, to answer, but yeah, it, it varies a lot with how you measure inequality. Like for instance, like what you say, ethnic inequality, the ethnic inequality story comes from the work by Gladys Sederman and so forth, but it's actually about ethnic groups participating in political um, structures. It's a very, very specific way of dealing with that. So it doesn't apply to ethnic inequality across the world in general. It applies to very, very specific points. Polarization is another one. Polarization it seems to be linked to inequality. It, even with uh, uh, horizontal inequality, depends on the spe specific way in which it gets measured. But let, let's talk more. <laughs> um, the other question, uh, uh, Martin, also the gentleman behind, uh, those are related and they're great questions. Um, the first one, interesting thing, so uh, focus on the Latin America case. You're absolutely right about the demand for um, uh, live, changes in living standards will kick in. And what we have is, say, the cash transfer programs come, they seem to have a clear effect in at least preventing High, uh, civil wars from reigniting, at the very least, seems to be doing that. But at the same time, we're absolutely right, created expectations amongst the middle classes, because these programs were really targeted at the bottom of the distribution, created expectations for better services that were not arriving and were not associating with these uh, programs. So there's a problem there, and we go to the whole debate about uh, cash transfers versus uh, cash transfers, the answers to all that, because we're missing the whole state capacity and provision of services side of things. So um, I think you're absolutely right, and I think there's a, a problem too uh, that needs on expectations about what you can do with these programs to uh, adjust. And I know Marcella and I had a huge discussion in New York about this issue. So uh, uh, the other uh, question that that is uh, really excellent. I, I don't think I can answer. Um, I can just speculate, and it comes again to the issue about state capacity and how you see the role of the state versus the role of armed groups, and this is work Anna and I, with Anna Maria Bain, has been doing for a long time. And uh, uh, I, uh, I can only speculate that some of these programs, as long as they're being seen as being implemented by the state, and they're not being undermined by whatever reason, could potentially uh, reduce the legitimacy of armed groups. But also what you can't forget, it gets more complicated because a lot of the armed groups become the state. So I mean, when I say the state, I'll be a bit cautious about what we mean by this. But uh, the issue then is about can you use these programs to create not, not uh, a new social contract itself, but actually at the very minimum stop the use of violence as being a form of governance uh, and, and create alternatives for safety that don't involve uh, violence, etc. But uh, thank you for that. I think uh, it'll make me think much more about how to move that. It's a, it's a very good question, and I think we need to, to, to know more, much more about that. Maybe someone else. Just to close briefly, eh, Juan Pérez, si yo lo voy a contestar. No, si, sí, si estás de acuerdo conmigo. Yo te voy a contestar en español. Eh, eh, el alcohol, en efecto, está asociado con algunos suele estar asociado con, con casos de violencia, pero no toda la violencia ocurre como fuente de alcohol y muchas veces hay alcohol y no hay nada de violencia. ¿no? A mí me asusto ponerlo en el centro de la conversación de esa manera, porque creo que se requiere pedagogía y se requiere digamos, saber cómo, cómo, cómo usarlo y no haría como una propaganda para el alcohol, pero yo creo que las, las fuentes de violencia son mucho más complejas que solo, que solo el alcohol, eso es lo que yo… De acuerdo pero además porque estoy en desacuerdo con la conclusión 
y con la reacción y por ambas cosas. El alcohol no es la causa de la violencia, la causa de la violencia es el machismo y lo que nos está matando son las justificaciones. Cada vez que hay un titular de prensa o un artículo que dice ¿qué pasó en ese caso? Es que estaba borracho, es que tenía celos, es que, le, es que nada. La esencia es el machismo y tan es así es, la comparación más nítida es con los países nórdicos. Consumen mucho más nivel de alcohol y los casos de violencia son mucho más bajos. Entonces, el problema cuando decimos los celos, el alcohol, la rabia, el desempleo, es que no estamos poniendo la atención donde es. Y el problema es el machismo. Pero además, creo que justamente... Sí, lo que tenemos que hacer como sociedad es no dejar pasar uno de esos argumentos causales. Puede haber cosas que incrementen, pero ta, el primer caso que desvirtúa es, uno, a las mujeres les podría pasar lo mismo con el alcohol y no hay la violencia elevada contra los hombres. Y dos, los países nórdicos tienen niveles de violencia mucho, mucho más bajos y miramos todas las gráficas presentadas, entonces es efecto causal. Eh, de hecho, se lo pongo en concreto. Cuando las discusiones sobre ley seca para que no haya violencia, no hay peor política que esa, porque está disimulando la real, es la real razón y estamos camuflando en el alcohol la real razón, que es la, el machismo. Con eso cerramos. Gracias.